Um, clicker question number one. Most euchromatin is best described as beads on a string, facultative, 30 nanometer filament, metaphase chromatid, or bound to a scaffold. Again, feel free to chat. Ten. No penalty for guessing. Five, four, three, two, one. <clears throat> so, a uh, couple things about this question. I, people in the front row, unfortunately, have me listening to their conversations. A uh, couple different ways to approach this question. Uh, euchromatin is basically the opposite of what? Heterochromatin. So that's one way to think about this question. So what would heterochromatin be? That's clearly not going to be any of the answers which are there. Uh, the next sort of thing is, OK, what are we talking about in terms of you know, beads on a string, facultative, 30 nanometer filament, metaphase chromatid, um, et cetera? So let's see what people thought. Um, it's kind of a distribution here. So <clears throat> basically, we can ignore metaphase chromosomes and bound to a scaffold. That's fine. Uh, Question is beads on a string, facultative, or 30 nanometer filament. So beads on a string is the nucleosomes bound to just individual, actually, if anything, naked DNA with no histone H1. You basically never see that inside the cell. So it's not beads on a string. Facultative is an interesting one, because what's facultative mean? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Now, that's very much true for heterochromatin. Uh, Turns out that most euchromatin is euchromatin most of the time, which leaves us with what? The 30 nanometer filament. Oops, let's show these again and actually select the right answer, which is C. OK, our next question. <clears throat> A closed circular DNA with 5,000 base pairs and no rise would have a linking number of 5, 10, 250, 500, or 5,000. That's not, that's not the way it is. The reason the string is lacking histone H1 is not lacking histone oh, okay. H1. <laughs> okay, the key to this question is what? 
ideas? So we've got linking number and rise. What's missing? Twist. What's twist for DNA? 10. 10 what? 10 base pairs per turn, 10 base pairs per wrap. And so that's going to be each of your twists. If you have zero rise, what's the linking number? Linking number is what? Twist plus rise. Rise is zero. Everything left is twist. Right? Make sense? No? Yes? Obviously. Or hopefully it did, otherwise just people guessed. It's another possibility. Um, <clears throat> OK, so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of today, um, continue with histone modification. Talk about a little bit last time, how do you control heterochromatin? This is that facultative heterochromatin, sometimes heterochromatin, sometimes not. At the end, we'll talk a little bit about metaphase chromosomes. There's some discussion of this. It's actually not in this chapter of the textbook. It's in chapter 17. So any of the figures there are from that particular chapter. Um, I think it's important to include that in this section of the course rather than leave it till cell biology next term, which I will not be teaching, in, which is what I answered for one of the other previous questions. And then we'll talk a little bit about mostly the human genome. Again, we're kind of anthropomorphic. We care about us. And so we'll talk a little bit about the human genome and some of the aspects of it, which are really, I think, kind of fascinating. First, I want to talk about modifications to histones. And most modifications to histones are, not surprisingly, on the parts of histones which you can get to even while they're in nucleosomes. So while they're in nucleosomes, you've got the core histones all packed around with the 150-odd base pairs of DNA wrapped around it. Then you've got these tails hanging out at the end. And so these are the ones which are available for modification. All those modifications are covalent modifications. They're shown here. In fact, just three, I believe there are about 10 or 12 now known covalent modifications to histones. But most of them are going to be methylation or acetylation, and in some cases, phosphorylation. If you look at the methylation, this is almost always happening on our friends, the lysines. Why are lysines so important? Lysines have what kind of charge, neutral pH? They have a positive charge. So what are they interacting with? The negative charge on the DNA, exactly. So what happens if you methylate a lysine? Does it still have a positive charge? No. So you basically neutralize that positive charge. On the other hand, what happens if you phosphorylate something? What does that do? Gives you a negative charge. What does that do? Pushes things away. Yes? So the question is, um, why is methylation of the lysine changing its charge? Um, and that's because it's normally going to be a basic amino acid residue. So it's picking up that extra hydrogen from the water. If, however, you methylate the first two, if it's you know, not in its ionized state of the hydrogens which are there, then it's not going to be as easily ionizable. And so what it does is actually changes the pKa of that. But as soon as you've got three methyl groups on there, as you'll see, which we often is what happens, then there's nothing to be charged at that point. So it can't do that. OK, uh, the question about that. So it's, a lot of this is really about changing the charge. You can also acetylate. Um, acetylation doesn't really change the charge um, that much. And it's really very often, again, at the basic level, it's that balance between methylation versus acetylation which is going to determine the actual activity. This here is just shown all four of the core histones. Here is these blobs on one side and a number of modifications that have been found to happen. You don't have all these modifications happening at the same time. In fact, if you look here, just take the example of, oh, where's my pointer? Here it is. Um, position 9 in histone H3. It's actually probably the best studied of all of the amino acid residues, probably in any histone, if not all amino acid residues of any protein. Um, so you see here it can either have, this thing will actually work for me, um, either methyl groups or acetyl groups. 
And so this is, again, just lots of different modifications. Again, most of the modifications here happen on histone tails, but you do have some modifications that happen on the core histones. That's just shown here, where we have a normal nucleosome structure in the middle, and then the various different modifications that can happen there. There's also mentions you can have ubiquitilation. Um, ubiquitin is hopefully what Eric talked about. Um, this small peptide which can be added to proteins. As soon as you add something like a peptide, it's going to really clearly change your structure. And certainly the nucleosomes have to have very defined structures. However, in, able to be able to, in order to be able to modify these core histones in the middle of the histone, usually you have to have some kind of dissociation that happens. How do you have dissociation of nucleosomes? What do you need? Enzymes, what kinds of enzymes? Give you a hint. Chromatin. Chromatin remodeling complexes. So a lot of times to get these modifications of the core histones in the middle, you need chromatin remodeling complexes or it's Friday, it's foggy, our brains are depressed. Histone chaperones. So to get these modifications, very often you'll need that. Unless, of course, they're on the sides of your nucleosome, which if it is in a really opened up state, you can have some interactions um, which are coming in from the sides. But usually you have to have some kind of chromatin remodeling complex or histone chaperones to change these kinds of things. So why do we have these changes that are happening? It's actually kind of getting back to your question about the modification of the lysines here. We now have our ammonia group, which had that positive charge, but now that charge has basically been neutralized by the addition of all of these methyl groups. And what happens here is these methyl groups are now bound to a very specific protein. And so now, in this particular case, trimethylation of a lysine residue or an arginine residue, of course, you can have either one of those there. Um, that's now bound to a very specific protein. Um, I just love the name of this particular domain, you know, PhD domain here. Um, I can't remember how they came up with that. I think it's like three different proteins that they all have this particular domain. Domain means what in terms of proteins? So yeah, domain will have a particular structure which leads to a particular function. But is it usually a whole protein or part of a protein? It's very often part of a protein. And so we'll, we'll see that in just a second, because usually these domains, this particular domain, binds to trimethyllysine. But it turns out it binds specifically to trimethyllysine in the context of histone H3. So you can have something which is going to bind to trimethyllysine and histone H3, but also could bind to trimethyllysine in a different place if you have the same sequences, or you need a different domain that's going to bind to that. And what that means is you have these what are called histone code readers. And I should try and move this out of here, because I don't need this in the way. Um, which is a whole collection of different domains, which are now going to interact with lots of different modifications that you have to your histones. Also known as the histone code reader. We'll talk about the histone code in just a second. But basically, this is multiple either domains of one protein, like we have here in this little light green version, or a whole bunch of proteins bound together as a multimer, which bind to multiple different modifications that you have on your histones. Why is this important? Well, basically, it's because this protein now provides a landing site for another protein which we'll see what it does in, in just a second. But this could be very important for usually transcriptional regulation, turning on genes. It could be important for changing the structure of chromatin right next to where you have all of these modified nucleosomes, which are sitting right there. So this is a nice cartoon version of what that looks like. What a real one looks like is much more like this. Um, here's a nucleosome, and here's one of those reader complexes bound around it. And the key to this is really these things are really big relative to the 
DNA, the nucleosome bound complexes. So if you look at this, now how can you have 30 nanometer filaments here? How can you have stuff which is really being compressed and still have this interaction with them? And so these large complexes have to be able to get into the DNA at any given point. Now this is the reader remodeler complex in the textbook. Yeah. That is correct. So I, I, the, what I said is, again, sorry to repeat their, your question here, but did you say that the histone code reader could be one or multiple different proteins? And the answer is yes. So you could have one, and when I say one protein, that's just one polypeptide chain. So it's going from an N terminus to a C terminus. You could have multiple domains in it that are binding, or you can have multiple N to C terminal do, um, sequences, which are then going to associate with each other. So um, you, you end up with both. This is, in fact, again, this is the figure from the textbook. This is a relatively simple version. Um, most of them actually look much more like this. So you've got the nucleosome over here on one side, and then you've got all of this extra stuff here, which is involved mostly in binding to those other proteins. So you see, this is not interacting with the nucleosome so much. It's much more involved in interacting with, with different proteins. So what is this histone code? This is now, in fact, the same image that we had before. This is histone H3. It's one of the most heavily modified of the core histones. And we'll focus right here on the lysine, which is at position 9, can be methylated, can be acetylated. So classic example of this K9, as we always talk about it. Again, molecular biologists are lazy, so they don't like to say lysine. They just call K. So K9, um, when it's modified with three methyl groups, binds to a PhD domain containing protein, the histone code reader. And the reader of that histone code says, hey, this is a part of the genome that we want to compact. It wants to be silenced. We want to be turning off these genes. On the other hand, if lysine at position 9 is acetylated and you have methylation at lysine at position 4, this is really typical for very active genes, and so genes that are turned on. So methylation in and of itself doesn't necessarily lead to shutting down of gene expression. It's methylation of a very specific place in your side chain, which leads to that. Um, you also have methylation of different molecules that leads to different things. So if you look at now all the possible modifications that we have up here at the top, clearly this is potentially extremely complex. And we're still trying to figure out what the histone code actually means. So we know for a few cases, and particularly these ones right here, that these particular modifications lead to heterochromatin formation, gene expression, or gene silencing. But there's clearly lots of other modifications, and we don't know what a lot of those modifications are really connected to. Um, maybe for some genes, they're connected to one thing. For other genes, they're connected to others. So that's a very active area of research is trying to figure out what all of these modifications are and looking at them in terms of chromosomes. Yeah, was a question? Sorry. See the arm. Are we going to have to know these three things for the exam? I don't know because I haven't written the exam yet, but um, I would say it's certainly fair game. <laughs> yeah? So, um, does yeah, so. Again, Eric obviously did a really bad job of explaining this. Whenever you're looking at protein sequence, um, again, this is molecular biology polarity. There's a start and a stop. So the amino terminal amino acid is one, and then you just count from there, from the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus. Any other questions on this? So. <clears throat> Okay, we've got these things. Yes, these modifications could be on the exam because you'll notice I'm going to talk a lot about them. 
Generally, the more I talk about something, the more likely it is to be on the exam. But again, I haven't written it, so I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so you have this modification that happens. But sort of how does it happen, and why does it happen? Usually, this has to do with the transition between euchromatin, heterochromatin, et cetera. So how does that happen? Again, for most of what we're going to be talking about for this class, it's about what genes get turned on and what genes get turned off. This, we'll get to what we talk about right at the end. Again, human genome, 6 billion base pairs. Um, you need to express a few of those genes at any given time in any given cell. So you've got to pick and choose what genes to turn on and what genes to turn off. Very often that happens due to modification of the chromatin. So here we have a generic gene regulatory protein that's usually a very specific DNA binding protein. So it's going to bind to a very specific sequence in the DNA, usually a regulatory sequence. Once that protein is bound to the DNA. It could be binding because you have nucleosome breathing, as we talked about last time, or that particular region happens to have a whole bunch of GC, and so you don't get very many nucleosomes that form in that particular place. Doesn't really matter. Once it binds, however, this is now bound to DNA, and very often this is now going to interact with an enzyme, which is now going to modify the histones. So the two classic examples of this, I say, are histone acetylases. What I didn't put on here are the histone methylases. Um, but again, these are sort of the main kinds of proteins that you have associating with these gene regulatory proteins. So gene regulatory protein binds to the DNA, specific position, then binds to this enzyme. This enzyme now will change the histones right next to it. If it's acetylating. I don't know if you remember the code from last time, because of course you're now going to know it for the exam because we've been asked about it. Um, acetylation at position K9 leads to gene expression. Yeah? So it's both a very specific protein and a very specific spot on the gene, is that what you're saying? So the gene regulatory protein is a specific protein in a specific place. These modifying enzymes, of course they're modifying histones and nucleosomes, which are everywhere. And so those are going to be much less specific. They just have to be brought to the right place in order to get that change which is going on there. Yeah, but these gene regulatory proteins are usually extremely specific because you have one gene that you want to express at one time in one particular cell. Yeah, right in the back. OK, so the, the question here is, um, maybe it's getting back to the question about the histone code, is you know, do you have to have both modifications in order to get gene expression, or is one sufficient um, for K9 and K4? So you need to have trimethyl K4 and acetylated K9. Um, the answer is yes and no, which is what makes studying gene expression and then the histone code very problematic. Uh, you've got some cases where you actually have to have both, or have to have both. In fact, a lot of these studies have been done where you look at genes which are being expressed, and then you look at the histones that are associated with them. And then you find most of them will have K9 acetylated and K4 methylated. But in some cases, you'll just have the K9 methylated. Um, very rarely do you have K4, sorry, K9 acetylated, and very rarely will you have K4 methylated. So K9 seems to be the critical one, as we'll see we'll keep following um, K9 as we move through here. So it's really critical, but it's in combination with other things seem to be more or less, sort of a more of a fine-tuning um, kind of thing which is going on there. So histone acetylase, again, puts the acetyl group on that particular K9, usually again, particularly for what we understand about these things. Um, and then, of course, the deacetylase, what does that do? It takes it back off. So you can think of these as sort of an activating enzyme, which is putting on that acetyl group, and a deactivating enzyme by taking it back off. So that happens. This is what people call the writer, that first modification. But then what happens is you don't have these specific DNA binding sites between each of these nucleosomes. 
to have them binding and have these, let's call it in terms of an activator, a histone acetylase, which you bring in, that once you have the acetylation of the histone, now you have the histone code reader complexes, which can come down. Those will associate with histone acetylases. And so you end up with this positive feedback loop where once you're acetylated, then you'll continue to acetylate. Once you become methylated, then you'll continue to methylate. So exactly the same thing happens here with, with methylases and demethylases. Yeah? Yeah, so the, the, the question here, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that you have, these are things that are really sequential. So first you have, so say we have unmodified histones. Very rarely have completely unmodified histones, but we'll just assume we've got unmodified histones to start with. Then you have the binding of a gene regulatory protein to a very specific sequence. That then leads to the first modification of your histone. Once that's modified, now your much more nonspecific histone code readers can come in and bind to that, which then also will stimulate that usually the same modification taking place. So it's sort of a one or many. So that's that first step is really a single step as it happens. Yeah? Is deacetylation an alternative to methylation in terms of you know, shutting down expression? If we're talking about K9, yes. Of course, you're talking about K4. It's a different story entirely. So, um, but yeah, if we're just looking at the lysine at position 9, acetylation, gene expression up, methylation, gene expression down. Yeah? How many nucleosomes does this go for? I think we're in two slides. We'll talk about that. Yeah, so again, just repeating the question. So if we're talking about this, the positive feedback loop is really just going down the line from one histone to the next. Yes, exactly correct. Okay, so that's basically what we talked about here. In this particular case, oh, excuse me, we have chromatin modification. As you'll notice here, it's expanding the DNA between the nucleosomes. And again, this is allowing other proteins to bind there. In the opposite case, we have heterochromatin formation. Now we'll have methylation at K9, for instance. Could be other changes that are happening on the histones, but we'll just use K9 methylation now. K9 methylation gives you a modification here, which will be read by, again, a histone reader complex, which will then methylate everything else. <laughs> But also, usually you've got these chromatin remodeling complexes, which are here as well, which are also helping one way or another. How do you get the chromatin remodeling complex there? Due to the histone read writer complex is how you're getting those actually to um, that part of the DNA. So the next question, which obviously comes up, as I promised you, two slides along, um, how does this go all the way through the genome? How do you know where to stop? Um, and that has to do with these barrier proteins, which gets back to that heterochromatin effects that we talked about last lecture on Wednesday with the white eyes versus the red eyes. Um, and what happened there is this barrier basically disappeared. Um, barriers basically come in three flavors, um, either specific physical barriers, which is what you see up here. Now we have some part of the nucleus, and this is just given the nuclear pore, it could be some other part of the nucleus as well, which binds to a protein which also binds to the DNA. And so that just stops any of these complexes, particularly those writer complexes, from moving any further along your DNA. So that'll block it. This seems to be relatively uncommon. More common seems to be either a specific binding site in your DNA for a protein, which will just then block any kind of interactions with further nucleosomes, or probably the most common, which is the one down here at the bottom, this is where you have an enzyme which is 
backing up against what's coming along. So for instance, you have a histone acetylase, which is started out by your specific protein, then you've got your nonspecific code reader also acetylating, 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 gets to a certain point where now you've got a histone deacetylase that's sitting down on the DNA and says, hey, you know, none shall pass. Um, bad Monty Python reference. Uh, but that's sort of the idea here, is that they've got then this specific anti-enzymatic activity, as it were, which is, is coming along. So you've got a, a combination of these things. Yes? Um, probably B and C are, are most similar. We don't actually know <laughs> um, which one is the most similar of these. Um, certainly you get quite a lot of B and C, and we'll talk a little bit more about B later on, because if you remember those looped structures, it seems that any given loop is usually separated from heterochromatin going from one, or euchromatin going from one loop to the next loop. So the ends of those loops seem to do a really good job of blocking the spread of heterochromatin. Yeah? So the question here is, you know, could that barrier protein in C be specific for a particular kind of modification? That's a fabulous question, because if you think about it, I just mentioned the, OK, we've got histone acetylation, for instance, which is spreading along. This is a histone deacetylase. So if acetylation is happening and coming along, OK, fine, you've got a histone deacetylase. However, if you've got a deacetylase wave coming along, nothing's going to happen. It's going to go straight past it. So that gives you a much more flexibility in terms of how you have your modification in that particular region of the genome. Yeah? Yeah, so where, how do the barrier sequences, sorry, how do the barrier proteins know where to be? And that's um, basically, sorry to you know, <laughs> paraphrase, but yeah, if you notice, all of these are binding to DNA. And so all of them are binding to specific places. And that's why, again, getting back to our example last time where we had the red eyes and the white eyes, that sequence is now moved because there's been a change in your chromosome. And so that move of sequence now leads to that change because it's in a different place now. Mm -hmm. So are the proteins binding to a single like strand or are they compacted so they're in the same like the same base pairs are in that whole spectrum of fifty nine for a Or like is it a single strand of DNA that those pieces are all binding to? Uh, so I guess the, the question here is um is it binding to a bunch of different strands, different DNA sequences for instance, bring them together? Um, it seems to be just one specific sequence on one specific strand of DNA. But we'll get to that when we talk about super uh, nuclear structures in just a second. Yeah, one more question. We need to move on. Yeah. So the question is, how does the nuclear pore relate here? Um, so this, in fact, the very first barrier proteins were found that bound to DNA and to nuclear pore complexes. And so that's why we have that first example there. There aren't that many nuclear pores. There are a whole bunch more barriers that are present in, these, uh, in our genomes than there are just than our nuclear pores. So let's look at this. Um, in fact, uh, it's probably a little bit hard to see here with our projector. But basically, what we're looking at here are chromosomes. And these are polyene chromosomes, so they're all lined up next to each other. So we've got multiple copies of them. But the important thing here is that we've got chromosomes which don't have this methylation at K9 of H3. That's histone H3, K9, lysine 9. Um, they're very localized. And you find these very localized areas and very sharp boundaries where this is started and stopped, so this is where those barrier sequences are. Here's a barrier sequence, but all this region right here, this is the area where you have active DNA, and so these active things which are, are happening right there. In addition to covalent modifications of histones, we have a few variable histones, or also known as alternative histones. They're present at a lot lower levels 
inside the cell than the standard core histones, H2, H2B, H3, and H4. Um, but these have very specific roles. They have the standard histone fold. So up at the top here is our normal histone, histone H3, and then a couple of modifications of histone H3, histone 3.3, 3, 3, um, which it turns out is very much involved with transcriptional activation, um, but has the, basically the same structure of the histone fold, but a very different tail. SENPA, which as we'll see in a couple of minutes, is really involved in centromere formation, has a slightly different histone fold and a completely different end terminus. Similar kinds of things are true with H2A, um, H2AX, H2AZ, et cetera. Probably not critical to know all of those histone <coughs> modifications here, certainly not for H2A. For H H3, I might be asking questions about these a little bit later on, because we'll talk more about them later. Um, but the idea here is that you've got the core, which is very well conserved, but those extra tails, which are really quite different relative to each other. Get an alternative histone into a nucleosome, however, what do you need? What do you need to modify cores? You need two things, two different things. Histone chaperones and chromatin remodeling complexes, exactly, to do that. The best understood of these alternative histones is that um, alternative histone H3, which is specific for nucleosomes. So you have these histone chaperones and the nucleosome remodeling complexes. Here, those now interact very specifically. And again, particularly for the SENPA, <coughs> you've got the excuse me, centromere specific histone. That tail interacts with all the proteins that are involved in binding the centromere to the microtubules, which is what you need for separating the chromosomes whenever you have mitosis or meiosis. So it's that tail which is giving you the specificity to say, hey, here's where you need to bind. Now, we talked a little bit about um, centromeres before. I just kind of skimmed over it. But it's a very specific structure much more of a structure rather than a sequence, that these nucleosomes are going to be associated with, and they're again providing this connection. This leads immediately to the question of, well, how do you find centromeres and keep centromeres of centromeres, particularly if they're not a conserved sequence, but much more of a conserved structure? Once you do replication, you have your one copy that goes to two copies. The centromere's got to stay in the same place. If your centromere moves around, you end up with a huge mess when you try and underdo mitosis. So keeping the centromere in the same place is really important. So how the way that happens is when you replicate your DNA, that DNA is being replicated, it has nucleosomes that are associated with it. If you're replicating the centromere, those nucleosomes have the nucleosome-specific core histone with them. And so those will dissociate in the presence of these histone chaperones and reassociate basically just because they're in the same place. You're in the same place, you go through, you have this alternative histone, you pull the strands apart, you make a new one, the histone chaperones are popping things on and off, you just pop that same one back on right there. And so that's what you can see down here at the bottom. Your specific histone H3 and hopefully you remember from last time we talked about assembly of histones. H3 and H4 usually stay associated with the DNA, whereas H2 and H2B exchange. This is exactly what's happening down here. Absence of centromere, normal replication, normal H2A, H2B come on and off. In your centromere, we've got these alternative histones. This replicates straight through. These alternative histones, because they're H3 and H4, are staying associated with the DNA, and you end up with centromere DNA, which is here. <clears throat> this is sort of a reminder. We talked about this last time as well. This is just a reminder. This is true for heterochromid. It is also true now for centromeres. If you have replication that happens now of a piece of DNA, you'll have a barrier sequence right here in the middle of it. One side is heterochromatin, the other side is euchromatin, 
when you replicate, you're going to end up with twice as much DNA, but you only have half as many of the proteins. Half of the nucleosomes will be modified and have those proteins that are associated with them. The other half will be modified differently and not have proteins in this case or different proteins that are associated with them. So what happens is that same kind of positive feedback loop that we talked about for the modifications that take place, the histone, code reader, writer. You have, sometimes you have that, but it turns out that a lot of these proteins that are stably bound to nucleosomes stimulate the binding of that same protein right next to them. And the classic protein for this is called heterochromatin protein 1. Again, molecular biologists have no sense of imagination. Um, HP1 binds to modified nucleosomes that are present heterochromatin, and it loves to bind to more HP1. Then, of course, you have to have these barriers again, which will block the spread of that heterochromatin from heterochromatin into euchromatin. What does this look like on a genome scale? It's basically all of these positive feedback loops. So if you've got euchromatin in one place, it stays euchromatin. If you've got heterochromatin in another place, it stays heterochromatin unless you have some particular change that happens. So again, some gene regulatory protein, something else that says, okay, here's a place that we need to change what's here. But otherwise, this is maintained really very stably and even from generation to generation through these positive feedback loops. And we'll talk much more about positive feedback loops as we move on through the rest of the course. Wanted to now talk a little bit more about what we talked about last time in terms of active versus non-active DNA. This is how you can, in fact, visualize some of these things. We talked about these loop domains. Again, the supercoiling here, unfortunately, supercoiling is not shown for these um, 30 nanometer um, fibers wrapped around each other. When you have really high expression of one particular domain, what happens is this becomes much less condensed. Um, and to have this, you need to have modifications to histones, usually have chromatin remodeling complexes. And also, if you look, and that's what's sort of shown over here, where your RNA polymerase is, and this is what's transcribing the genes, you see that these are, which is where these blobs are right here, associated with these decondensed parts of your chromosome. Most, if you look down here, of these guys, the loops that you can see, basically, don't have the polymerase associated with them. Those loops that you can't see, those are the ones that actually have actively transcribing genes. Yeah? So the question is, you find a higher concentration of barrier proteins along the scaffold exactly is where you find lots of these barrier proteins. They're going to be down here. They're going to be down here at the bottom. So you can visualize this active genes here. These are what are called the lamp brush chromosomes, which you find in amphibian oocytes. Not the only place that you get gene transcription. Um, another place that people have really nicely visualized what's going on with active genes is in the uh, polyteen chromosomes that you find in salivary glands of fruit flies or pretty much any insects where all of the genes line up or just all the chromosomes line up with each other. So you've got exactly the same thing going on at the same time in the same place. This gives you nice bands, which you can see down here at the bottom of the slide. But again, if you look where your RNAs are being made, you don't have nice bands here. This is a really diffuse part. And what's happened is everything is opened up in terms of allowing the whole transcriptional machinery, which again, we'll talk about in about a week and a half, uh, allowing that to get to the DNA. And what we'll see is that transcriptional machinery is big, really big compared to the DNA and the nucleosomes. So you have to be getting rid of, in fact, almost everything, even the n people argue about whether the nucleosomes are there or not. Uh, but certainly have removed everything else in order to get your transcription taking place there. So <clears throat> that's visualizing what's going on there. And basically, this is just an example of, okay, you can see that you have this change in chromatin that's taken place. We had the cartoons, modifi modification of the histones, particularly on the tails. What happens there? You have acetylation of lysines that dissociates 
that whole dissociation allows you to get the gene regulation machinery into the right place. So how do you fit all of this inside a nucleus? And at first, people always thought that nuclei, in fact, at first, until probably about 10, 15 years ago, that everything was sort of mixed up together in the nucleus. All of it, um, different chromosomes, particularly in interphase, were all over the place. There was no sort of structure. But then what people did is they took exactly the same technology that was used for the karyotyping. We had the rainbow karyotyping. We and I bind different fluorescent tags to different chromosomes and did this now on non-metaphase chromosomes, just in nuclei. And what they found, really kind of their surprise, is that these guys were not overlapping and completely mixed in with each other. Each of the individual chromosomes was in a very specific place. And this is, I should say, this is one particular example of one nucleus. Um, if you look at what the color coding is here, let's see if there's a good one down here. So we'll take the big, um, the big yellow one. That actually is one copy of chromosome 6, which is right here. Um, the other copy is over here. All nuclei are not going to look like this because the chromosomes are going to be in different places, but they're all separate from each other. Each of those chromosomes is really separate relative to each other. And that was a big surprise. You know, people didn't think that this was what was going on there. And so part of the problem has been, in terms of understanding what's going on inside the nucleus, is our microscopes just haven't had high enough resolution to be able to go in and examine you know, where every individual thing is. Those lamp brush chromosomes and the polyethene chromosomes that we looked at, the only reason we can see those is because many copies of the chromosomes lined up with each other. Here, it's just one copy of the chromosome. We can see the whole thing, but we can't see the little details about what's going on there. Except for, in the last literally five years, where super resolution microscopy has really taken off. And again, that's what um, three guys got the Nobel Prize for this year. Uh, and that's allowed us to literally look at individual places where genes are being expressed. In that particular case, shown in a cartoon down here at the bottom, we're looking for these red dots. And this is a classic nucleus. Now we've got the diploid genomes. We've got two copies of this particular chromosome and two copies of the one particular gene, this little red spot right here. So separated in, in terms of the nucleus, very specific regions. I'm not going to call them domains because that's confusing in terms of proteins. Specific regions of the nucleus where you have each of the chromosomes. And then in an inactive state, these guys are all together. But in an active state, and this is, again, the, the real advantage of the super resolution microscopy. Oh, oh, yeah. I don't think you can't even see it on here. You can't see the little red spot. Um, but the red spot is moved away from the rest of these chromosomes in a way which is probably actually going to a place in the nucleus where you actively are undergoing transcription and making copies of this particular gene. So <clears throat> we've now talked about B form to beads on a string to 30 nanometer chromatin. These guys packaged up into loops. Next question is how do you go from these loops to actually get a whole mitotic chromosome? And again, this is stuff from later on in the text, but I think it makes sense to talk about it now as opposed to force you to wait for. 12 weeks or something like that. So you've got these loop domains, and that's what's shown down here at the bottom. Somehow you've got to get these now into your metaphase chromosome. And so there are really two proteins that are important for this. The proteins are called condensin and cohesin. These take those loop domains and basically loop them on top of each other. And the way that happens is so to think about this as a kind of a, a hair clip, so SMC proteins, these guys basically sort of serve as claws. They'll grab around these supercoiled domains and move them together. They do that 
together with this ATPase domain. And so the ATPase, when you have ATP there, basically what it does, it allows these things to close, close around these loops. Now, how do you get this only to happen when you're going into metaphase, because that's the only time you really want to condense your chromosomes, is you only make these proteins at the appropriate time. They also have these really long coiled coil structures. So we talked about coiled coils before. These are long alpha helices that have hydrophobic side chains in their proteins, approximately ever seven amino acids. And so what those do is they wrap around each other. And this is a great way to have a nice long protein, which in this case is involved in grabbing these loop structures. These grabbed loop structures then will form stacked supercoiled domains relative to each other. And that provides almost all of the compaction that you need to go from this sort of lamp brush like chromosome to these condensed chromosome sections here. So we've gone, this is yeah, about four or five times extra condensation, or, which is happening in condensation again due to these condensed in molecules. These also interact with each other, and they form these ring-like structures in the middle. So this head domain is what's involved in grabbing your structures in the first place, and then pulls them together to give you these structures. And you can actually see this if you take a metaphase chromosome and stain for the condensin, you can see that it's right down the middle of your metaphase chromosome here. It's these red dots that are here. And here's an electron micrograph. The condensin is in the middle. And these are all those loop domains which have been pulled together by that process. The last thing I wanted to talk about is how you get the sister chromatids to come together. Again, in diploid organisms, you've got mom's copy, dad's copy. In order to get them to the appropriate place, in order to have either crossing over that's going to happen in, myto in meiosis and proper division that happens in mitosis, you need to have these guys pair with each other and then get separated do the microtubules interacting with those alternative histones bound to the centromeres. So that, it turns out, is a protein which is extremely similar to cohesin, I'm sorry, condensin, which just binds the two different copies together. And so now your cohesin is pulling your two copies together. Condensin is pulling each of those individual ones together. So if you were going to look at oops, where that is in one of these metaphase chromosomes. The condensin is right down here along the backbone. The cohesin is going to be pulling these two things together here right in the middle. So that's how you get that final condensation process that takes place. So we don't have very long to talk about the human genome. Yeah, quick question. So seven amino acids, the question about seven amino acids, We're talking about coiled coils. So when you have two alpha helices that wrap around each other, they usually are going to have hydrophobic amino acid side chains that come out every seven amino acids and then intercalate or bind to each other, also known as a leucine zipper, but much better is the coiled coil process. Okay, so we'll cover some of the highlights of the human genome here. And um, stuff I skip over, by the way, and don't talk about in lecture is not stuff which is likely to be on the exam. So it's another reason why I record these things. So um, if you look at the human genome, um, we got the human genome sequence, the first draft anyway in 2001, which feels like forever ago. A couple of years, I'm going to be teaching classes where people weren't even born the time when we didn't have a human genome. Uh, <clears throat> we're not quite there yet. Um, but basically, the message about the human genome is that the business end of the human genome, i.e., all of the actual protein coding sequences, are only about 1.5% of the genome. And the vast majority of the human genome is made up of these repeated sequences or the so-called junk DNA. Uh, 
And we'll get back to junk DNA right at the end today. Uh, these repeated sequences, I li like to think that they're all viral because, of course, I'm virocentric. But there are some really obvious parts of the genome. And actually, about 8 to 10% of our genome is clearly viral in terms of where it came from originally. And that's, again, 8% versus 1.5% actual protein coding sequences. And these are all coding sequences of viruses which are there. So we're more viral than we are human. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, with the viral DNA in our genomes, it would have had to have gotten into the gametes in order that to be passed along from generation to generation? Yes, most definitely. And so the gametes of our ancestors, really, is where that's come from. Yeah? So the, talking about active viral DNA, which is recently more viral. Right. So the, the question here is about, um, is it still functional viral DNA? I'll just you know, paraphrase that. And is it actually being expressed? The answer is, in some cases, yes. In most cases, no. But in some cases, yes. And I'm more than happy to talk about that offline. And we'll talk about it a bunch in the virology course um, when we get there. So how do we know this? Um, what parts of the genome are protein coding and what are not? Um, a lot of this comes from studying similar organisms and similar genomes to ours. A um, couple of things that <clears throat> are important for this. One is looking at chimpanzees and gorillas, which are basically identical to us, and that's basically all I wanted to show here. Um, the sequences of a couple of different proteins are more or less identical. If you think about the chimpanzee genome versus the human genome, 99% identical. Um, but probably more important in terms of thinking about understanding our genome, it's better to look at things that are more distantly related to us than things that are so closely related to us in terms of understanding what parts of the genome are going to be important for making proteins and what parts aren't. And this gets back to one of the questions somebody asked a while ago. You know, how, how do we know what's an intron and what's an exon? Well, one of the ways we know what's an intron and what's an exon is if we just compare the mouse genome to the human genome. In exon sequences, which are where you have protein coding, you notice know, mouse on the top, human on the bottom, they're practically identical to each other. As soon as you get into the intron, huge numbers of differences relative to each other. So that's one of the ways that we can tell just by looking at sequence of the human genome versus the mouse genome, which ones are actually likely to be introns versus exons. So the question is, if you compare coding DNA versus junk DNA, um, the coding DNA is where you see this real similarity. Um, junk DNA, and again, as a name I absolutely abhor, and we'll see why in just a second, uh, <laughs> is um, generally in those non-protein coding regions, you don't have very much conservation. But we'll move forward and skip a couple of slides here and get to this one, which is where there are a number of sequences which are what are called <clears throat> These uh, conserved or multi-species conserved sequences. So that's just these blocks that we have here. Here's a light blue block at the top here. Just look at chimpanzees, orangutan, baboons, marmosets, lemurs, etc. Um, it's basically humans. Um, it's not surprising that these are all identical to each other. But even things as different as a possum, and even in some cases some um, fish and um, some animals, sorry, avian species down here at the birds at the bottom. Um, these are completely conserved sequences, sometimes not even in protein coding regions. And so one of the big questions we're trying to figure out is to try and figure out what those sequences are important for. Because if they've been conserved over millions of years of evolution, probably in some cases hundreds of millions of years of evolution, they're going to be important for something because there have been some selection to actually keep those sequences. And so that's a really open area of trying to figure out what's going on there. And that's something that we're getting close, I think, to understanding um, right now in some of the newer projects which are going on there. Um, one way to see this is you know, multiple domain proteins. We talked about this a little bit already. Talked about some chromosomes. I just wanted to get to the end and talk a little bit about the, um, I'll do one, one thing on here, and then we'll talk about the human genome for the last five minutes or so. Uh, 
One thing I didn't particularly want to mention is differences between individuals. And so a lot of times people say, OK, we've got 99% identity between chimpanzees and humans. But there's actually a lot of difference between different humans. And a lot of that difference is actually not just in individual nucleotides. It has to do with how many copies we have of one particular sequence. And that can be a very short nucleotide sequence. It can be a much longer nucleotide sequence. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is that Dr. Kim Brown in our department, this is his area of research, is looking at what these um, extra copies have to do with things. So just to finish up, I want to talk about the human genome, uh, first published in February of 2001, which is frighteningly long time ago now. Um, two different journals, both published the genome at the same time. Why two different journals? Because there were the good guys and the bad guys. Um, the good guys of the Human Genome Project, so a link to that here. They started mapping, and then they did some sequencing, and then the bad guys, the company, came along and just said, we're going to just sequence absolutely everything. And it was literally the process here. So if you think about 2001, the main reason that these guys here at the company thought they could do this is because they thought that Pentium processors were kind of cool. Um, and that allowed them to do some of these processes. Of course, Moore's Law, you know, computation has gotten so much better over literally the last number of 14 years. So you can do all kinds of things that are very different. One thing I wanted to point out, unfortunately, it's hard to see down here at the bottom. Uh, this in 2001, where they declared a truce and published the papers, um, 10 to 30 percent was missing. Three years later, we're now at 99.999% accuracy, 99% of coding regions. There's still a bunch of the human genome we don't know. And that's because of the technology that we have. And we'll talk about the technology right at the end of the course. But there's a lot of stuff which is, is not there. Some surprises. We talked about this before. Only about 20,000 genes. Only 2,000 of them are unique. We think we're special, but we only have 10% of the genes that are unique. And that probably mostly comes from this process. Last thing I wanted to talk about. And that is that, yes, only 1.5% of our genome is protein coding, but 80% of the genome is being expressed and is probably important for function. And what that means is, getting back to your question about those viruses, you take 80%, that's got a lot of the viruses and a lot of these repeated elements. And so there's, pardon? 80 or 85? 80, again, it depends on how you count. But OK, I may have said 85, 80, 85. The last number from um, ENCODE, at least in September 2012, was 80. But it's probably higher than that. So a lot of our genome is being transcribed. It does seem to be important for function. We have no clue what most of that's doing. So we're all going to have something to do for the next couple of decades. So no class on Monday, Martin Luther King Day. Um, we'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>